welcome to The Code Tray, the podcast of the ACCP Emergency Medicine PRN. I'm your host, Christian Kroll, an emergency medicine and ICU pharmacist at the University of Iowa Hospital and Clinics. To view this recorded presentation, head to our YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash at ACCP EMEDPRN. And for PRN members, slides can be found under the Libraries Entry section of the ACCP Communities website. Thank you all for joining me this afternoon to discuss Edamorph. I do not have anything to disclose today. Pain is the most common reason patients present to the emergency department. And as I'm sure most of you know who are here today, trauma patients often experience a large pain burden with 70% of trauma patients reporting pain in the pre-hospital setting. Literature suggests that patients who present to the emergency department with pain may experience more pain during both exams and procedures than those who receive adequate pain management therapy. Commonly, our mainstay of therapy for moderate to severe pain is opioids. However, patients may not receive them due to various reasons, including delayed or absent pain assessments, aversion to opioid use by both healthcare providers as well as patients or even patients, caregivers, and families. We also have to consider delayed administration due to access as well as the side effect profile of opioids. Prior literature has explored alternate therapies to opioids, including ketamine and NMDA antagonist. A 2015 study by Losvick and colleagues assessed ketamine versus pentazosine in an opioid agonist in a low-cost and rural trauma system in Iraq. And they found that patients with an injury severity score greater than eight, who had at least, meaning they had at least a moderate injury, had a significantly better systolic blood pressure as compared to those who received an opioid for analgesia purposes. Additionally, Tran and colleagues compared morphine using 10 milligrams for their adult population and 5 milligrams for the pediatric population and compared this to ketamine using 0.2 to 0.3 milligrams per kilogram slow IV push. And their mean dose of ketamine in this study was 15 milligrams, and this was specifically for rural trauma management. And in the study, the physicians observed similar reductions in visual analog scale ratings in both groups. Which leads us to the why of today's study. Given the side effect profile of opioids, as well as the addictive properties of opioids and the ongoing opioid epidemic, the authors aim to assess efficacy of alternate analgesic agents for traumatic pain with the goal being to demonstrate that low-dose ketamine is non-inferior to morphine, as there's currently a lack of evidence surrounding IV ketamine versus opioids, specifically in the pre-hospital trauma patient population, bringing us to today's study methods. This was a prospective, randomized, parallel group, single-blind, non-inferiority, multi-center study. For single blinding, the treating physician was not blinded due to the need to not only dose the medications, but also because it was assumed that they would know what the expected presentation was after patients received ketamine. The study was conducted from November of 2017 through November of 2022 at 11 out-of-hospital emergency medical service centers in France, which differs from practices here in the United States as emergency medical service centers in France include a minimum of an ambulance driver, a nurse, and an emergency medicine physician as a mobile intensive care unit. To be included, patients had to be at least 18 years of age. They had to be conscious, which was defined as a GCS of 15. And they had to have acute traumatic pain with a pain score of at least five based on a verbal numeric rating scale, with this rating scale ranging anywhere from zero to 10, zero indicating no pain and 10 indicating worst possible pain. And given this inclusion criteria, patients had to also be able to speak and be able to rate their pain. Exclusion criteria is listed here on the screen, but to highlight a few, this included unstable vital signs, so a systolic blood pressure less than 90 or greater than 200, a heart rate of less than 50 or greater than 150, and a respiratory rate of less than 10 or greater than 30. 
pregnancy and breastfeeding, as well as allergies to morphine or ketamine, or acute pulmonary edema or acute heart failure were all reasons for exclusion. Additionally, renal or hepatic insufficiency, head injuries with acute intracranial hypertension, patients who required emergent fracture or joint reduction, as well as patients who received morphine for the same acute pain or acute psychiatric illness were also excluded, as well as our patients who are already receiving opioid agonists or antagonists. Patients, once they met inclusion criteria, were then randomized one-to-one, either receiving morphine, two milligrams or three milligrams IV push with patients who weighed less than 60 kilograms receiving the two milligrams versus those weighing greater than 60 kilograms receiving the three milligrams. Or patients were in the ketamine group where they received 20 milligrams IV push over two minutes. And you'll notice here that a weight-based approach was not used in the ketamine group. Following the initial administration, Repeat doses could be given every five minutes with the same dosing strategy being used in the morphine group, whereas in the ketamine group, the dose was reduced to 10 milligrams. Additionally, rescue doses could be administered at the emergency medicine physician's discretion for patients with a pain score of at least five after multiple doses at 30, 45, and 60 minutes or on ED admission. These therapies were continued until patients either had a numeric pain score of less than or equal to three, or an adverse event occurred with adverse events, including profound hypotension, unconsciousness, or respiratory depression requiring ventilatory support. And the last reason to discontinue these therapies were patients arrived at the emergency department. For primary outcomes, This specifically looked at the between-group difference in mean change in verbal numeric rating scale pain scores measured from the time before administration of the medication to 30 minutes later. Secondary outcomes included the between-group difference in mean change in verbal numeric rating scale pain scores from, again, the time before administration. However, this went then until the 15-minute, 45-minute, and 60-minute mark, as well as ED admission. They also assessed the incidence of rescue analgesia, as well as weight-based dosing of the study drug at 30 minutes in milligrams per kilogram. And lastly, they assessed a change in vital signs, again, at the 15, 45, and 60-minute mark, as well as on arrival to the emergency department. For safety outcomes, they assess the incidence of adverse events, as well as the need to withdraw analgesia and potentially use an antagonist if the adverse events were severe enough. 224 patients were needed in order to reach a 90% power in order to detect a non-inferiority margin of 1.3 with an alpha level of 0.05. A reduction of verbal numeric rating scale pain score of 1.3 was derived from three other trials focused on extremity pain, specifically in the emergency department. The target enrollment, though, was 248, and this was in order to account for protocol deviations with an assumption that 10% of initial patients would not be able to be included. Other statistical analyses included a chi-square test or Fisher exact test to assess nominal data, a two-tailed t-test or Mann-Whitney test in order to assess continuous data, and a Waltz method test in order to assess the primary outcome. Now that we've reviewed our methods, we can jump into our results. 287 patients were identified with 251 meeting inclusion criteria. 128 and 123 were patients were randomized to ketamine and morphine, respectively. And from here, 109 patients in the ketamine group and 105 patients in the morphine group were then included in the per protocol analysis. As you can see here on the figure on the screen, the majority of patients were male, and the median age of the included patient population was approximately 51 years. And the median estimated BMI for the included patient population was 24.5. Unfortunately, you'll notice here that weight was only reported as BMI and not in pounds or kilograms. You'll also notice here that there were more patients in the ketamine group who had baseline comorbidities, including hypertension, diabetes, and coronary heart disease, as compared to those in the morphine group.
the majority of injuries were extremity fractures, which were more commonly observed in the morphine group, followed by soft tissue injuries, which were more common in our ketamine group. The median injury severity score in all groups was four, with minor scores ranging anywhere from one to eight. And both groups had a median initial pain score of eight, remembering that patients verbalized their initial pain as well as their pain throughout using that scale from zero to 10. And when they assessed patients' vital signs specifically on enrollment, they found that there was no difference between baseline heart rate, blood pressure, respiratory rate, peripheral oxygen sat saturation, or GCS. The median dose of ketamine administered in the study was 40 milligrams which does appear to be higher than typical pain dose ketamine of 0.3 milligrams per kilogram, but it is difficult to assess when all we know is the, BMI, the median BMI was 24.5. The median dose of morphine was 12 milligrams. As you can see, Tylenol administration was consistent between both groups. And when looking at the out-of-hospital time, we do notice that the morphine group um, did have a longer out-of-hospital time by about six minutes. Here, we see a figure on the screen looking specifically at our primary outcome, where the mean difference in pain scores from drug administration to 30 minutes later was 0 0.1 in the per-protocol group with the ketamine group having a mean change of negative 3.7 and the morphine group having a mean change of negative 3.8. Meanwhile, in the intent to treat population, the mean difference in pain score was 0 0.2, with the ketamine group demonstrating a mean pain score change of negative 3.6 and the morphine group experiencing a mean pain change score of negative 3.8. And while both groups favored morphine, ketamine still was able to demonstrate non-inferiority. As expected, there was a statistically significant risk difference from baseline to 15 minutes with heart rate, blood pressure, specifically systolic and diastolic blood pressure, with ketamine, of course, causing an increase in these vital signs and morphine causing a decrease in these vital signs. Additionally, there was a greater mean difference in GCS in the ketamine group versus the morphine group. Additional secondary outcomes demonstrated that ketamine was associated with faster reduction in pain points per minute. There also was no difference in rescue analgesia use between the two groups, nor did either group require withdrawal of the analgesia, analgesic agent or use of an antagonist in order to manage severe adverse effects of these agents. For adverse outcomes, in total, 49 patients in the ketamine group and 19 patients in the morphine group did experience adverse effects, with the risk difference being 24. As you can see, more patients in the morphine group experienced nausea, although this was not statistically significant. On the other hand, though, in the ketamine group, more patients experienced visual disturbances with every one patient who was treated with, or for every seven patients treated with ketamine, experiencing a visual disturbance, one patient of those seven. Additionally, more patients in the ketamine group also experienced emergence phenomena, which included dysphoria, agitation, and hallucinations, with one patient experiencing this effect for every five patients treated. And based on all of the described findings, the authors concluded that while more adverse events were observed in the ketamine group, the use of IV ketamine versus IV morphine was non-inferior for traumatic pain in the out-of-hospital setting. Bringing us to our final discussion point today, my analysis of the study. Beginning with strengths, the study was multi-center, prospective, and randomized, which enhanced its internal validity from a study design standpoint. Additionally, the most common injuries described in this study were extremity fractures and soft tissue injuries, which most commonly occur in adults who are at least 50 years old, and this aligns with the study population that was included in this study, which enhances both external validity as well as generalizability. And lastly, a WALDS test was used in order to assess the primary outcome and was an appropriate statistical analysis and method for a non-inferior study in order to control for type 1 errors. However, the study also did have weaknesses that we must account for. 
Specifically, the authors really emphasize the impact that these results may have on the opioid epidemic. Yet, baseline demographics did not include comorbidities such as opioid use disorder or pain disorders, which, as we all know, may impact one's tolerance of pain medications and may prohibit us from providing patient-centered dosing, as well as ensuring that we're providing patient-centered care in order to provide them the most appropriate therapy based on what they're willing to receive. Furthermore, the quantity of opioids received prior to enrollment was also not described, which also, again, may impact analgesia requirements. Next, EMS practices differ from those in France specifically differ from those here in the United States, with an emergency medicine physician and nurse being present on the mobile intensive care unit, which limits some of the generalizability to practice here in the United States. And with the emergency medicine physician not being blinded to the treatment options, this could also potentially introduce performance bias. Lastly, a weight bent based dosing strategy was not appreciated in the ketamine administration group, with patients likely receiving doses much lar larger than our typical sub-dissociative doses or pain dose regimens that range anywhere from 0.1 to 0.6 milligrams per ki kilogram, but are more common than not 0.3 milligrams per kilogram. And these higher non-weight-based dosing strategies are likely what drove the clinically and statistically significant adverse event findings of visual disturbance and emergence phenomena with ketamine use. In conclusion, this study does provide additional information related to non-opioid analgesic use in pre-hospital settings for pain associated with traumatic injuries. Ketamine was non-inferior to morphine for pre-hospital pain secondary to traumatic injuries and was associated with, with a statistically significant higher incidence of adverse events, including visual disturbances and emergence phenomena. And while ketamine did demonstrate non-inferiority, we as pharmacists must also consider the comorbidities of the patients presenting to us, the severity of the pain, the type of injury, the side effect profile of the drug options we have, and the doses we then choose to administer to these patients in order to ensure that we are adequately and appropriately treating pain while preventing adverse effects. Future studies should be conducted in order to assess higher acuity trauma patients, as well as geographical differences of non-opioid analgesic use and the impact these analgesic agents may have on in-hospital pain man management. At this time, I would like to acknowledge and give a big thank you to my residency program do director, Dr. Elise Metz, as well as my residency journal club coordinator, Dr. Blake Robbins, who provided valuable guidance and feedback to make this presentation possible. And with that, I will open the floor to any questions. If you have enjoyed this presentation content and would like to hear more, subscribe via your favorite podcasting app. Additionally, make sure to check out our YouTube page for all recorded presentations. Thank you for listening to this week's ACCP Emergency Medicine Journal Club presentation. Join us weekly for review and discussion of new journal articles in emergency medicine. This podcast provides general information only. It does not offer individualized medical or professional health care services, including pharmaceutical advice. The contents and materials in the podcast are not intended to be a substitute for inpatient pharmaceutical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. And the use of the contents and materials in the podcast does not constitute a pharmacist-patient relationship. As a result, the information in and materials linked to this podcast are applied at the user or patient's own risk. Users or patients should consult their physician or personal healthcare professional. The user or patient should not ignore or delay seeking care because of something they heard on this podcast. In case of an emergency, the user or patient should contact their physician, call 911, or go to the nearest medical emergency facility. The views and statements expressed on this podcast are those of the host and guest, and should not be interpreted to reflect the official position or policy of ACCP or the Emergency Medicine PRN.